George, I can't explain what this means to me. Thank you for taking the time to come here and speak with me. It means so much. You respect socks, and I have uh, made a, a lot of sock choices in my life, so it just seemed like a natural fit. You've made a lot of great sock choices, oh, and honestly... You know what I'm wearing now, though. Oh, you have to do it at <laughs> the end. Yeah, the end, that's, right? Right? that's right, yes. That's right. So, I mean, as much as I want to talk about okay. them right now, okay. we're going to go through a bit of your career first. Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, you don't have... know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, okay, all, right. all you, all, all you. Mean... Uh, you've come a long way since the days of the contests where everybody had to call in and spell your last name right. Remember that? That was a long time ago. The first time we did that contest was in 93 when I worked in radio and then they did it again at much and that was like seven years later that's a long time ago <laughs> it is and you've done so much in that time but if you think about it that's really what it's all about anyway right is do you have the kind of familiarity or connection with the audience where, pe where, the, where they're no longer the audience where they're just people who you you interact with right that's like a, it's a thing a relationship that's the whole crux of any good career in this business is that Right, where somebody feels like they might know how to spell your name. And also the fact that it was an ethnic name. And, you know, we live in a pretty white country. We do, yeah. we do. And it's, it's hilarious when an ethnic name is on television. So I, I, I always like that. And with that name, you've made a huge name for yourself. Uh, I can't even begin. Your resume is ridiculous. You started off in BC, actually, in radio. Yeah, it was my second job. I was in Kelowna. I worked at a rock station, and I was also a mascot. I was a lizard for this radio station there. So I hosted a metal show on Monday nights called High Voltage. I w assisted them in the music department, and then, which, is, which really consisted of photocopying charts and sitting in there listening and fighting for songs. They let me fight for songs, which I believe I loved, and, and I was a mascot. That's they, that was the only part of the job they paid me for because no one else wanted that job. And I was like, yeah, I'll be a mascot. You might have just gotten me over my fear of mascots because normally your head goes to a creepy guy inside. Right. You're not so much that. I'm not a creepy guy, but I am definitely the kind of mascot to stay away from. Because I used to get drunk and uh, like three in the morning, four in the morning. And I'd be like, wow, put them, do people curse on your thing? People I was do. like, fuck it, put the mascot costume on. And I'd just like stumble around Kelowna in the mascot costume. It's true. It was really fun. It was a fun job. It was a long time ago, but it was a fun job. And now for people who didn't know, you were hanging out with George. Pretty awesome. Yeah, well, here I am. That's right. I was the guy in the mascot costume, stumbling around. But but I didn't really interact with people when I was that drunk, just people I knew, because I was trying to be very careful. Very professional, you know, obviously. Very, as much as one can be professional when they're <laughs> strolling down the hallway of an apartment. You know. George, what made you want to get into this crazy industry? I don't know that I ever wanted to. You know, I, I love music, and I love politics. Well, not, not politics. I love social engagement, social justice. And I like punk rock. So when I was a kid, metal music, you know, helped solidify and articulate the isolation that one feels when they're a young kid, when they don't feel like they fit in. Punk helped me find a way to take whatever young boy anger I would have had and help me focus it. And it, it gave me a target. I'm a big believer in the enemies. And there are enemies out there, right? There are people who oppress, suppress... And so, but I didn't know how you could make a living at that. I didn't really quite think of that. So I wanted to be an architect and a, and a, and a graphic, like an artist. I was a visual artist, but I got kicked out of the art classes. So I had no path. I couldn't. Was that for being drunk in a mascot class? No, no, no. I wasn't drunk then. No, 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 no. I was a teenager this time. Yeah. So I got kicked out then. And then I, they wouldn't let me take art classes in my school. And that was my goal, my career goal. So I thought maybe I'd be a funeral director. And then I failed chemistry. So that was it. Like I really failed chemistry. You know, I didn't even get into chemistry, so I you're failed. ahead of me there. I failed so badly. When I hear people talk about how education's important, I'm like, ah, ah, I don't Is really, it though? I don't have much of one, to be honest with you. But I got that street education, right? So I, so I kind of was just figuring out, well, actually figuring out what I couldn't do. And then I went to get a motorcycle license. So right next to the movie theater where I worked was an adult learning center. And I was 18, I think, at the time, 17, 18. I was maybe 17. And I... I saw a course calendar for the motorcycle course, and I flipped through it, and I saw radio broadcasting, and I went, oh, I'll do that. You know, but I, but I, I was such a student of radio, and such a student, like I used to call and talk radio stations when I was 10 to get on the air to get into fights about politics. So I, I really did. So I was like, oh, you can do this for a living? I didn't know. So in the end, it turns out maybe I always was going down this road, which means you don't have that much free will. 
which is fine. So that was kind of it, you know, and I just got into it. I didn't really try in school the first six months. Didn't care. I liked it. Like, I liked radio and communication, but I wasn't much of a student. And then I decided to try. Like, out of nowhere, I think somebody, I think my mom or somebody said to me, like, you're paying for this, so why not just try? Like, That's a good point. Yeah. I and I hadn't really tried. I had a failed, you know, run in the militia. I had a failed, I just wasn't that guy. I wasn't from a neighborhood where much was expected of you. Much wasn't expected of me. My family never had any, put any pressure on me to do anything or be it. They wanted me to, my mom put a lot of pressure on me to be a decent human being. That was what the focus was. She didn't really care what I did for a living. There was no pressure to achieve anything. It wasn't our story. We're all super blue collar ethnic family. So my family was just like, be a good person and get a job where you can carry yourself. That was it. And you've carried that good person to a whole other level. You do so much work in like humanitarian work. Make sure you, that wasn't my alarm, sorry. Yeah, no worries. You do so much work when it comes to you know. Uh, let's take um, the the Haitian. You you raised twenty seven million dollars. Helped raise twenty seven million dollars. Yeah, yeah. You know that, but that just comes down to the thing I was saying about my mom, right? You your only job on this earth, sincerely, it's going to sound bullshit, but it's actually not bullshit. The more you do it is just to be there for others. So can you, can you do your part to create a community, right? And in this business that we're in, you get a lot of breaks, right? This is a weird business. Like I am, like you're interviewing me because I'm a guy that interviews people, but here we are on camera. It's a weird business, right? It makes, I mean, we're not making things. We make content, whatever that means, right? And so if you're gonna get the breaks and the benefits of a, of a life where you can feed your artistic vision, your creative spirit, right? Well, you better do something with that. Like, you better do something with that. And the people that I like the most are the people that are working on behalf of others. My whole childhood was about, like, my mother made me do that stuff. So, like, of course, it's my job. Uh, what else am I going to... Like, I look at billboards, right? And I see this person selling me this soda or this cereal or this energy drink or this whatever... And, okay, sure, but you better be selling peace, justice, environment. you got to be doing that, too. And I'm, I'm a big believer in that part of it, right? Maybe that's the music I listen to as well. And you know what I've always loved about you is that you are that down-to-earth guy. You always have been, and you've always had so much passion behind what you do. Uh, a lot of passion. You do. I remember watching you back in the day on Much Music, and... You know, you'd speak really quickly, but you would get your point across. It was clear. It was, it was precise. You think, like, here's the thing. I look back at some of that shit now, and wow, did I speak quickly. Holy cow. My, I was remembering my air checks my, when I was, had a job in the early 90s in radio, mid-90s. And my boss was like, slow down. But I used to always say to him, I have a lot to say, so keep up. And... I don't now. I watch it back. I'm like, I don't. I can't even understand what I'm saying. But I think what it was was I was so excited to to be on there and, and not to be on TV because I didn't apply for job much music, right? I didn't. It wasn't my goal to be on TV. I, they came to me and said, "Do you want to come work here?" And I was thinking, not really, because it's not, you know, what the kind of music they were playing at the time, the pop music at the time. I had a lot of respect for everybody there. I had a lot of respect for what it was, but it wasn't my thing. So I didn't think I could authentically go on the air and play you boy band videos. It wasn't my thing. And they never offered me that job. They offered me a job to interview people and to talk about what was happening in the culture. Much news, rapid facts, all that, that stuff. And I took those minutes on the air very seriously. I made sure I wore a t-shirt of a band that I loved so somebody at home could see a band that they would never maybe see the video for because much would never play it. And why would they, right? It wasn't, that wasn't their mandate. But it was my job. To, to share good music with you. And it was my job and our producer's job to talk about, like we were just, just traveling with a friend of mine who I worked with that much for many years. She taught me how to do a lot of this. And we were doing transgendered issues 17 years ago. Yeah. Be not because like, oh, look at us. No, it was just important. 
Like it was important to us then. We really the much music thing. I felt was it was our responsibility, and I defy you to find another network that has done this back then. We created a space where if you were watching us across Canada, or in the U.S. where you're broadcasting, or in some of the other countries, you were welcome. We created a space that was pro-woman, pro-gay, pro-trans a long time ago. And it wasn't me, but I, I was a small part of it. We were all, we collectively wanted to do meaningful work. And you won't find a network back then that was doing that. I, you won't find a network today no, you won't. <laughs> that's doing it, that. You'd be hard yeah. pressed to find it. As, for, as part of the mandate, right? Like we, we would, if we played a video that was super racy, we would then do like a much talks afterwards where we were trying to contextualize these sexual images because we knew we had young boys and young girls watching. You know, and more so for the young boys, you know, sometimes it's like you got to understand what, what sexuality is, especially as it relates to women, so that you don't objectify them. Like, th this, was, this was shit that much was doing in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And that's, that's one of the reasons I look up to you and always have is because, absolutely, it's, it's because you're real, you touch on the topics that need to be touched on, and you've always done so. It was a team, it was a whole group of us who cared about it, and I don't know, and much love to Denise Donlin and David Kynes for letting us, because that was, it, was their, it was important to them too. It was such an interesting time in media, and I think, and I'm not a nostalgic guy, but I think that the modern conversation could do with a little bit more of that. Like, be brave as a unit. Like, I wish we were at much music when Colin Kaepernick was taking a knee. Black Lives Matter, you know, the the Trump administration. Now I, I like because now I have a platform where I can do it anyway, and I don't have to. I don't care what anybody says, which is great. Yeah, and no sponsors. I don't care what they think either, right? It's just like we we believe in doing what's right, and pretty much every meeting I had at Much Music, from the top down, it was what's right. When nine eleven happened, I was going on the air. We we, we had a meeting in the uh, in the in Sheila's office, the boss's office, and. She said, what do you want to say? I said, well, I, I, what I want to say is don't watch us. Go watch the news. And she said, that's what you should say. This is the boss awesome. empowering us to go on TV and say, turn the channel. Watch this stuff. Let's come back at the end of the day and let's talk about it together. Who the fuck does that now? Like, who does that now? Nobody. Nobody and that's, that, that's why YouTube is such a big thing now, right? YouTube is big. But the thing about YouTube is that the people who are getting really famous on YouTube, I find... Um, it's their life. And I guess that's cool. That's fine. I'm not criticizing. I watch it. Yeah. I watch it. I've seen every Casey Neistat you can imagine. Yeah. I've seen them all. I, I don't know why I know everything about him, but I love that guy. I love Casey Neistat. You know what it is? It's lust for life that I respect. I respect his, his joy. Um, but what we did at much was it wasn't about us. Like, it wasn't about me. It wasn't even about the artist. It was about the relationship between all of us and the audience, the fan, the person, the kid at home. You know, I went up to the far north and I remember being up there and I bumped into a bunch of kids and I could see the impact much had on them. It's really like that's, there's a lot, we're in an era where a lot of people are focusing on themselves and that's okay. Self-care is super punk rock. But there's something to be said about the collective and much was really, really focused on the collective. I, it's greater than any place I've ever worked for That's that. so nice to hear. And I'll tell you that, I still get recognized for the Much stuff by people who are too young to have watched me at Much Music because it carried, you know? It did. Yeah. And it carried you on through your career, uh, obviously with a lot of hard work as well. Yeah. Um, you've, you've done everything. <laughs> I, I don't, you know sometimes when you go and you're, you go you do a post on Facebook, so I grab my phone, right? I'm like, oh, shit, I'm going to post this app. So I click on there, and then I click on my Facebook profile, and then you scroll down to hit the post button, right, to make a post. And you have to scroll past your, your, um, your, your, your job section. <laughs> and I'm scrolling past my jobs, and I'm like going, Jesus, what? I forgot I did all that. I'm just so lucky to have been a part of it. Hard work's really important, but hard work is most of it. No, that's not true. Hard work's half of it. Talent is this much. Luck is everything else. You need the grace of others, people who don't know you to take a chance on you. You need breaks from people who are just taking a flyer on you. Like, you need that. There's no, there's no self-made person 
in that era. You're not. You are. You benefit from the group. And I, I've been very lucky to work with, you know, with the exception of two years in my career of sports, well, six, but two in TV and sports, I've only worked for these really strong, smart, clever women. And I, you know, I, I look back at all the conversations that are happening today about what the industry is like, and I've, I've actually avoided most of it because I've only worked, like CBC was run by the strongest, smartest women you can imagine in media. Much music was as well. Not just the top, but all over, in every department. You know, David Kynes was at one point the boss of Much Music, but he empowered all these incredible smart women to run the business around him. So I think that's had the biggest impact on my career because my language is different. Fair enough. I'm a, I'm a fucking dude who would have said, not, not, I'm, not a, I'm, not, I'm not a misogynist, I'm not a sexist, so it's not like I would have said stupid shit like that. But I paid close attention to language because... I was raised in the television environment where you saw the impact of your words. You know, when you work in sports, like the Harvey Weinstein scandal broke, and you're watching football, and I think it was Sunday Night Football, and the uh, broadcaster made a glib remark. This team, the Broncos, are having a tougher week than Harvey Weinstein. And I'm watching it thinking, I know the guy who said it. I know what he means. But others out there don't. And I, I will never tell this gentleman how to live his career, right? Yep. But I know that if I said that on the air, I would have got my skull cracked, proverbially speaking, and I should have. Mm -hmm. So again, not a criticism of the broadcaster. Well, I mean, I, I just, I wouldn't, you know, everybody runs their own career. But because I came up in the culture I did, I would never have... It wouldn't have even crossed your mind. No, no. And if it did, my mind would have said, don't do it. Yeah. I'm a human. Hold back. Yeah, I'm a human. We all have jokes in our mind. That come up. That's how that's, humor is a is an is adaptation. It's how we deal with tragedy. Humor is a really important part of that, right? So I get the gallows humor. I get inappropriate comedy. I get all that. But when you're on TV, you have a responsibility, and I've avoided most of it because I wasn't raised in that situation. And I look back at much, and I think, you know, Denise Donlin, like Moses, Denise, David, Sheila, and Tanya Nachev. Those are the names that you can point to, and, and a few others, of course, and look at them and go, you shaped media in this country, and they don't get the credit they deserve. Not at all. They don't get the credit. Much was easily dismissed, and it ought not to have been, because it, it impacted people. And it's changed so much, and it, it's sad, actually, because so many kids growing up now will never know that feeling. And I guess the question is, what is the responsibility of a broadcaster, right? Is when you... I kind of look at channels that are targeted towards youth and I think you're like an alcohol company you have some great responsibility so you shouldn't get to operate the way everybody else does you got an audience and you need and we need them and every broadcaster in this country is the public broadcaster because they all you know if you took away grants and media funds no one would make any shows Right? CBC is the only one that does it. A prime time lineup, right? So every, every broadcaster in this country gets public money in some form. CBC is just the only one that's honest about it right. and upfront about it. So, you know, I look at much and I think, you owed it to the audience to be better, man. And now, but business, is, of course, has taken over and that's fine. But that's why I like doing the stuff I'm doing now online with Apple and on YouTube because it's, and on my radio show, because it's a free open conversation. And I want to get to that. You've done everything from music, hockey, politicians. You've spoken to everybody anybody could think of. It's a bit crazy, isn't it? It's insane. Yeah. So I know that this question is going to be out there, and I don't know if it's going to take you a minute to think of it, but uh, I have to ask, is there one person in particular that made a huge impact on you while you were doing an interview with them? I mean, there's so many, right? You know, the, the, like the, the most, Mike Fox, Michael J. Fox is more special than people know. Michael J. Fox, when you interview Michael J. Fox, I mean, you're there. Your heart is open. You are there. Bono, I learned a lot from Bono. I learned a lot from Oprah. Um... 
You know who's the most like legit dude ever? Eckhart Tolle. I tried to rattle Eckhart Tolle. So I, you know, he's super chill, super in the present, all the now business. So I, I put, I have an El Camino, a 1971 El Camino. It's a rough ride. Like it's a rough ride. I put him in the El Camino on the PCH, uh, you know, the Pacific Coast Highway in California on a long weekend traffic jam. I drove with him. We put GoPros in the car Perfect. and I wanted to see, would he still be chill? He was the most chill. He was the most legitimately connected to his philosophy person I've ever seen in my life. And it's that conviction. I really respect conviction. I don't need people to be perfect. I don't care about perfect. I'm not a perfectionist. I'm an executionist. Can I execute on a vision and then whatever it is, let it be. Nothing's perfect. And when it is perfect, you miss all the glory in it. You miss the, the magic that can happen. Um, but I really respect conviction. People who aren't bullshitting. Eckhart Tolle was like, so in the zone. <laughs> I'm just looking at him thinking, and I've interviewed him a couple times, and I'm thinking, motherfucker, you're amazing. Mike Fox is like that. Patty Smith is like that. Um, Bono is 100% like that. I loved interviewing um, Angela Davis. Angela Davis is one of the great civil rights leaders. You know, I sat across from Maya Angelou. I interviewed her in her house. And she started singing to me, like singing an old spiritual in the first few minutes. And I'm sitting there like this in my chair. And I just was like... And I'm staying locked on her eyes because she's looking at me. And I'm locked into her eyes. And I'm thinking, this is what a blessed life to be in the company of her, this glorious human being who changed so many lives and she was so in the zone, so convicted. I really respect that. Yeah. So I know that's not one name. No, but, but that's Atwood? exactly what I expected. Margaret Atwood's a game changer too. <laughs> but you know, the, the person I learned the most from as a human is Mike Fox. Learning about life from Mike Fox is pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I, I can only imagine his stories. Really cool. And uh, you, you have a number of stories yourself you're now doing... Can I give you an example of Michael yeah. J. Fox said to me? He obviously did not want to get Parkinson's. He obviously didn't want that. But he said it came at a time when his kids were young. And he had to stop working, so he was home. Had he not got that diagnosis, he said, uh, he probably would have missed his children growing up because he would have been on sets all around the world. But instead, he was home with his family. And... And that was really interesting because I almost got the sense, uh, again, I would never put words in his mouth, but he was okay with that. Yeah. It's one of those everything happens for a reason, right? Yeah. That's pretty cool. I mean, he didn't bemoan his condition. And it was really like he's, I watch grown-ups cry in the audience, cry when Mike Fox starts talking. Yeah, that's a human that definitely connects right with the feels, uh, which is amazing. I'd, I'd make him the governor general. Yeah. I'd make him the governor general, man. I, you know, I'd make him the prime. I'd like, I'd let him run for prime minister. He won't do it, but I wish a guy like Michael J. Fox would be an incredible leader, and is. Yeah. Uh, you are doing work with Apple now. Uh, tell us how you got into that. It's such a, such a different world to where you started. You know, it is, but in a way, it's not. I like scale, right? Hockey Night in Canada is a big show. I enjoyed that. You know, for the most part. It was all right. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. So to me, what was the, what's the next step up? What's, 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 in, what's, a, what's bigger than that? Well, Apple's the biggest company in the world. Biggest media company in the world too, really. Kind of a big deal. And so I was like, I don't, know, I don't know what to do. I knew some cats at Apple. I respected them. I knew them from different lives before they worked there, before I worked where I was. And so I started making this music series on my own. Like with my team our, our, we were all together I paid for it all and I just wanted to see what it could be and the truth is I was walking down the street I don't think I've ever said this on okay, but I was walking down the street past Much Music one day and they had boarded up the windows and I remember thinking to myself because it's all new people there for the most part but those windows are really important that intersection was important kids would come from all across Canada 
to be in front of that intersection, to go to those build, that building, and they got close to their favorite artists. And I, I remember kids would be banging on the window. Yeah. Every day I worked there, every day I'd go outside. You'd open them up. You'd open up, you'd meet them. Yeah. Like, it was really important to not know your audience, because that's too business. It was really important to just be what they needed you to be. Be there for them, right? And I walked by the bunch building, and I was like, oh, man, that's, fuck, that sucks. And before that, I had worked at a radio station called The Edge in Toronto, which is like your Sea Fox here, and in Vancouver, and... Power 97, Power I had a show on Power 97, too. I did, yeah. That's right. That was a strange time in my life. That was a really strange time. Um, and The Edge used to do a broadcast from the str a street, a storefront on Young Street in Toronto, even before I worked that much. And they did it before much did it, where the audience could come in, and the kids could meet their favorite bands. Like, I would interview... Green Day, and there's like stunned 13-year-old kids like this being eight feet away from Billy Joe or Mike or Trey. And so I, was wa I walk past them all, all the time. My entire Canadian TV career for 20-odd years has been on John Street, right? Uh, much CBC, CBC Radio, Hockey Night, all on the same street. And I, yeah, I've been that street for 20 years. It's crazy, right? <laughs> but I remember walking by, and I got a little pissed. I was like bullshit because again I guess I feel like media has a responsibility uh, and I know that's an OG approach but I don't care I stand by it I think the kids I think everybody should be doing that so I called a couple of cats at work and I said fuck it we're doing it we're doing it he's like where at my house he's like what do you mean we're gonna put concerts on in my house we're gonna interview people and we're gonna invite fans and he said in your living room yes everybody said that's a stupid idea and it is I said fine well, it's, it's a high-risk behavior. Okay. It's, it's high-risk behavior to let... There's, it, there's a lot of unstable people in the world, and, they, and social media makes it easier for them to be around you, right? So Now they know where you live. Right. <laughs> and sometimes they get in the house. Yeah. So I'm always like looking around thinking, all right. But I never worry about it. And I said to them, it's just stuff. If anything goes wrong, it's just stuff. I've been lucky enough to have no fear. I don't have any fear. I don't have anxiety. Like, nothing throws me off for the most part. So if I'm going to be lucky enough to have that brain chemistry, why would I hold anything back? Why don't I just go all out and honor my insanity, right, of, like, of recklessness? So, or not recklessness, but just fearlessness. So I said, we'll do it at my house. And they're like, where's it going to air? And I'm like, I don't know, man. Let's put it on, like, my CBC show, the radio show. And then let's just put shit on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram because that's where the audience is. And then everybody was asking, who's going to pay for it? And I said, I will, because it'll be fine. In the end, it'll be fine. Right. I had no idea that it would be fine. I really didn't know. And I, I went all out, right? I went all out and I thought, all right, well, let's learn how to do this. And then bit by bit, you know, we got Neil from Rush. We got the other guys from Rush. Then James Hetfield comes in a little later. In the middle, like Diana Krall calls. She comes in. Elvis Costello comes in. Grandmaster Flash comes in. Mixmaster Mike, the DJ from the Beastie Boys, sets up the decks on my kitchen island, plays. And I'm watching him play, and there's only three of us in there, right? And I'm looking, because we were just testing it out before we had audience. And I'm looking at him playing, I'm thinking, man, people need to be here. Then I was at Coachella, and I see Ian Asprey from The Cult. And I didn't really know him, but he knew who I was, and I, obviously I grew up loving his band. So I said to him, hey, bro, you got to play my house. He says, no problem. <laughs> and I went home and went, shit, I got to... Well, I gotta figure this out. I yeah. <laughs> so we, we booked we put everybody together, our team. We had never done it. And we just tried it. This band Dilly Dally did it first. Jazz Carche played. And then we started to grow from there. The kills played. And now we have the and they are as well the best bands in the world coming in. And so we looked at well who who would partner with us on this eventually, because at some point I can't pay for all of it all the time. And my team was like, shit, we need to find a way to make this a thing. And we want partners because we want more people to see it. And then, you know, I met with the cats at Apple. And their philosophy was bang on. They were, we want to be a part of this. We like what you're doing. They knew me from my past that I was in it for the music reasons. I knew, and they said, just keep it on your social media and YouTube. We don't want to limit who can watch this. Because everybody thought, well, then it would just be on Apple and no one would see it. Or, or so you could only see it if you had a membership. But the, the cats at Apple really believed in getting the best music out to the widest amount of people, widest audience. So I was like, well, that seems like a good deal. Yeah. 
So we partnered up and there's some, I love these cats, right? I love them so much and we work so hard together and we all, like, no, we want audience, we want a big business, we want it to work, but we make choices because we believe in it. And we, we say no to artists that we don't believe in. I mean, there's an artist that we were pitching, he was a really good artist, he's popular. And I was like, I like him, but like seven of his songs that he's gonna play, is just, it's, there's too much misogyny in the lyrics and I'm at that age now where I know better. I can't rationalize it anymore. I can't justify it. I can't justify me going on the air and telling 14 year old girls and 14 year old boys, you're safe here. And then bringing somebody into my house who says all that stuff. I said, you know what, I don't need that shit. There's a lot of places for you to promote your stuff and much love, much support to you, do whatever you gotta do. I'm not the guy. So these kinds of choices we make and we look at each other in our team and we're like, well, that person's big. I'm like, yeah, but how am I gonna live with myself? How are you gonna live with yourself? And the entire team wants the same thing. So it's pretty cool, you know, and it's rare. And I don't expect it to be, like the media's always changing, but for now it seems to really work. It does, and it, again, I said it at the beginning and I'll say it again, you have such heart for this industry, such, such passion and such belief in, in the music and getting the message out to the people. I do believe in it. And that's, that's one of the main reasons I respect you and look up to you so much. How's this going? This thing you're doing? Not just this not, is, not with me, but I mean... This is fantastic. Is a bit, yeah. I'm here with George Strong. No, no, not me. No, me no, no, the other. <laughs> I've seen your interviews. Like, how, are you enjoying it? I'm loving it. Yeah? Loving every day. What do you like about it? Honestly, I've just always wanted to tell another person's story. I don't have the talent, and I love hearing people that the do. talent to do what? Anything. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I can't sing, I can't act, I can't... I'm just, I'm just not a person with a lot of talent. But I love hearing about others. If I may, I once was in a store, and I had a pair of jeans on. And I put a jean shirt on. And then I put a jean jacket on. And in tuxedo? Yeah, the hardcore, but triple. I went triple, right? And the, socks. Yeah, I didn't have denim socks, no, but I had the triple. And this guy, I looked at this guy who was working there, and I said, what do you think? Can I pull off the triple denim? And he looked at me, he said, nobody can pull off the triple denim, but who cares? Just fucking rock it. Yes. And I looked at him, and I thought, yes. So, of course you can sing. Just fucking rock it. Do whatever you want. I will do karaoke if everybody else is drunk. Half the people who are number one on YouTubers or fucking Spotify can't sing. They just... They just auto-tune their shit. They're not even trying anymore to sing. <laughs> People used point. to try, and then they'd auto-tune it. Now they just talk like this the whole time, and then they auto-tune it. So, okay. if you're ever bored, YouTube, the, the conversation, a guy interviewed Aretha Franklin about auto-tune, and her face was just like, please, no please. It was really funny. Uh, yeah. That's like, I had the opportunity to speak with Lou Ferrigno, and talking to him about the Hulk today. That. I watched that. I saw your Lou Ferrigno interview. I watched that. He's a big dude, eh? You know how important Lou Ferrigno is culturally? Like, even being a kid and finding out that uh, he was hearing impaired, and you're like, okay. So it becomes the normal. Yep. It becomes the normal when you see the other. And he's not the other, of course, because nobody's the other. But people are meant, made to feel like the other. And, like, Lou Ferrigno, I love that guy. Super important. Painted him green. No special effects. I know, right? <laughs> I'm so over. CGI bores me. I respect all the artists, but I, but I, yeah, they painted him green. <laughs> Dr. Banner, right? Wow. Yeah. I have to ask. Yeah. Uh, we will get to your socks, yeah, obviously. I, I just want to make sure you're still good for time. This is much longer than you, you anticipated, isn't it? I'm totally okay with that. All right, I'm good too. Okay. I'm going to go, uh, all right, good. I'm good. All right, what do you cool. Want? Well, then we can keep talking. We don't have to jump to socks yet. <laughs> you can't see my socks. You can Not yet. Here. That's all right. Yeah. We'll figure it out. I wear red socks in an interview all the time, actually. I wear, used to wear a lot of red socks. And Frank Sinatra Jr., I was interviewing him, and he was fixated on my red socks. Uh -huh. And he had to talk about it. He was like, let's, he, and he listed all the OG singers who used to wear red socks. He just, he, was, he loved red socks. So where did your passion for socks come from? Because you have some wicked socks. Well, here's the thing. I, I never wear matching socks because I never want to spend a second of my life matching socks. Fair. And if when I die, and if it's true that your life flashes before your eyes, if one frame of that <laughs> is me matching socks by my washing machine, so buddy, 
uh, then I made a bad choice. I made a bad choice. So I pull shit out of my dryer, put it in my drawer. So that's why I never match, right? But I, f I found that on TV, everybody was so conservative and straight up. So I was like, oh, fuck it, I'll change my socks. Then, when I was on hockey night, everybody wore fancy socks on TV all of a sudden. MSNBC, everywhere you go. Everybody. So then I went straight to black socks. I wear them back. I tend to wear socks with basketball players on them often. Um, I don't even know what they have on now. I don't, we'll do it at the end. But yeah, but yeah. I have a pair of Shifley on them from the Jets. Every day I'm Shifley and Shifley. You do, eh? I do. Mark Shifley. Yeah. Are you a Winnipeg girl? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, that's nice. But you live here. I live here, grew up in Ottawa and Brampton. Brampton. I grew up in Malton. Yeah. Right next to Brampton. Um, when were you in Brampton? Three years. It was 96. Six to ninety nine. Brampton, that's awesome. I was in Malton just before that. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I love Brampton. Yeah. Russell Peters of Brampton. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Who, you, of course, you've interviewed. I have, but also when I was a teenager and I was a, an usher at a movie theater at the Woodbine Center in, in Rexdale, Russell used to come in when he was a young man, teenager too. He's only a couple years older than me, but I knew Russell because I was dating a girl in, who was from Brampton when I was eighteen, at seventeen, and she's like, "You got to meet my friend Russell. He's the funniest guy in the world." This is before Russell was a stand-up. Yeah. So I, Russell and I knew of each other through our social circle when we were teenagers. And now all these people, people walking by, <laughs> know who you are. Um, going back to your thing with Apple, that's obviously how you're getting all these artists is because you've built yourself such a great reputation. You have a great team, but people want to talk to you. Why do you think it is that they, that they confide in you? I don't know. I think that... Not everybody wants to talk to me, for sure. In fact, many have said no over the years. Really? Oh, yeah. I, have, I don't do a pre-interview. So, we'll just talk. Nine times out of ten, I don't even have a plan. Right? I've done the research, of course. I respect the artist. The producer I used to work with on the show, the old show, we would, it's called framing an interview. We'd frame an interview. We'd talk it out, and they'd jot some notes down for me. And it would drive them crazy because I didn't always use them. I almost never did. And because to me, interviewing, the art isn't the question. If you think about it, 60% of the questions you're going to ask, that I'm going to ask, Charlie Rose is going to ask, Barbara Walters, 60% of those questions, we're all going to ask the same questions. Because the audience wants to know some shit, right? 30% are the skill and the experience of the interviewer, right? You're like, oh, I got that. Maybe 20%. You're like, oh, you know, I got, I, I got a little insight. Only, but a, a bunch of other people will ask those questions too. Right. 10 to 15, 20%, that's all you. That's, and that's where you find out where you fit in this game. And people who do interviews are constantly trying to hit a lot of people, not everybody, are trying to hit home runs with every question, right? That's not how humanity works. If you had a friend who is trying to home run you with every time they talk to you. You'd stop talking to them. Get the hell out of my life. What are you, the cops? I've done that. Look at my friend. What are you, fucking cops? Like, shut up, right? What are you looking for? Right. You, what, you, what you want is an, is an actual experience, right? It's got to be comfortable. So I think when people come to be interviewed by me, there's no pretense for me. I really don't have ego about this. I know I'm not the, I know I'm not the cat. I didn't do it. I'm not the guy. But I am the guy that talks to the person, right? Um, also, I care genuinely about what they have to say. And to me, I look at what I do as emotional archaeology, as ridiculous like as that, that sounds. Like but that's what it is, right? So I'm trying to dig up the bones. And I'm digging up the bones with you. And sometimes the questions are as brute as a backhoe. And sometimes they're as tender and emotional as a little brush pulling dust off. And what we do is assemble these bones in the order we think works best. And then the person at home has to look at that and say... Now I think I know what animal that was. And that animal will always be different as it applies to them. Because your job, if you're lucky enough to communicate to strangers, which is what we do, right. your job is to be good company, to challenge them, to support them. I won't spoon feed anybody. I'm not having it. I hate being spoon fed when I'm interviewed. It's like, let's real talk. Life's fucking short. The world's on fire. Part of the reason why the media is so irresponsible, the president is such a maniac, is because the culture let that happen. Trump didn't just happen out of nowhere. <laughs> no. 
Those fucking no, he didn't. jackass Nazis. Think about this. 2017, we're talking about fucking Nazis. Marching with tiki torches. Dressed like the president on a golf course. That doesn't just happen. The culture lets That's, it happen. It's made. Right, it's yeah, made. Absolutely. So I, like, you can point to Rush Limbaugh, Roger Ailes, and a little bit Bill O'Reilly and go, it's your fault. You, you lied on, on the radio all the time. Alex Jones, who's the most dangerous person in media, they lie all the time, right? That's the media. So our, our job is not to be like them. Our job is to be challenging to the audience. I'm not here to make you feel better. I'm here to make you feel not alone. You're not alone. But sometimes it's uncomfortable because <laughs> the world's uncomfortable. Life's uncomfortable. And look, I would have a much bigger career if I was a fluffier interviewer. But, but then I don't you wouldn't that. have the following either. Yeah, and I don't want that. I don't want that. I'm not interested in... I heard Bono say a long time ago, I'm not interested in being the biggest. I'm interested in being the best. That's, that's interesting to me. And I want to be the best, but I want other people to be the best with me. Like this, the one thing about, I, I learned about, as a Canadian is we're in a band. This is, this, I don't want to be a solo artist. I'm in a band. You and I are in a band. You and I, dude, we're in a band. Like, we're in a band. We're better together. So that's what I want out of my out of, out of conversation. That's what I want out of interviews. And I think the roundabout way to answer your question is the people who come in know that that's what I want. And they will, they want to participate in that. And they know that I'm not going to bullshit them. I also don't do gossip because I don't care. Thank you. I don't care who you're sleeping with unless it's me. And then even then I might know. <laughs> That's what I've said to people before. Like, are you going to talk about my personal life? I don't care. I'm not sleeping with you, so I don't care. You know, if, you're, if you are a, a politician who runs on values, then your personal life's up for grabs. It's up for grabs. You are to be judged by your parameters that you set. So, other than that, I don't care. Like, I care about this. And sometimes I get it right in interviews, sometimes I don't. I don't beat myself up if they don't work. I used to. I don't do that anymore. I don't care. I do my best. And the, the guest knows it. When Hetfield came into my house from Metallica, I was at Standing Rock with a couple of friends. We went to Standing Rock to help out. And then I got a call saying, Hetfield is going to come to your house to do an interview. I was like, oh my God, I got to get home. So I had a pickup truck. So I hauled ass from South Dakota to get back to Toronto. I pulled into my house at like 10.30 in the morning and uh, drove all night through snowstorms and Hetfield walks in. And I'm watching this guy from Metallica walk in my living room thinking, tops. This is cool. <laughs> dope. Metallica's huge to me, right? I'm like, dope. Metallica's in here. And... He walks in and he's like, so what's going on? I said, no, just sit here in my living room, have a seat. And so he sits down and I start talking to him and he said, oh, are we doing this? Yeah. Like, like right here, just like this. No security, no makeup, no, no. We're just, we're going? Yeah. He goes, that's casual. Went, yeah, man. There's enough shit to worry about in the world. This ain't it. <laughs> you know, this ain't it. And I, I really like that environment. Some people don't want to do it. There's artists that I know who don't want to do it. There's some of my friends who want to come on the show and I don't interview them. And I told him, I said, you're not ready. Like, you won't, you won't be honest. You won't be your authentic self. If you're part of your mythology, I don't care. I'm not down with that. There's a lot of places to do that. Good for you. I'm not it. This is about real talk, real people being real. And we're trying to be good company to let people at home know they're not alone. The guests who play along, we really click. Yeah. The ones who don't, it's fucking awkward. <laughs> Yeah. A couple of silences. It goes bad. They might get up and leave. That's happened. Yeah. That's happened. Has there ever been an interview that you've been nervous for? No. No, but I get excited. Yeah, yeah there's moments where I, I've, I'm like anxious to get going. For sure. But not nervous. I, I don't have that chip yeah. in my brain. That's good. Yeah, I don't have it. I, I learned to process fear at a very young age. So, as an adult, like a celebrity mad at me, it's not going to throw me. Yeah. <laughs> the audience doesn't like what I did, not going to throw me. Right, life's bigger than that, <laughs> you know? So, I'm sort of past all that. Um, maybe when I was younger in the business, I was nervous, maybe. In radio. I remember the first time I interviewed Noel Gallagher from Oasis. I remember thinking, this could go badly. Really? But it didn't. It went well. Here's the thing. I got hired because, at TV, at Much Music, because... There was a very big rock star who had a very big fight with a VJ. 
the band took the tape from them, and this rock star was going to be really big, and Much Music needed a relationship with this person. But Much at the time didn't feel like they had somebody who could get into a fight the way I could. Okay. <laughs> Which is essentially what I was told. Right. They had great interviewers, great interviewers, but I was, I'm a particularly edgy kind of fellow. And this was really my first TV job. So they hired me, and then they brought me in, and they played me the fight. And I watched it, and I went, the guy's an asshole. <laughs> And he's like, yeah. So that's why we hired you. We need you to go down and do the interview with them. Don't go easy on them. Like, because they were very protective of the VJ, as they should have been. Much, was, much did everything by the book. But they said, we need somebody who can go down. And if it, gets in, if it goes to the proverbial blows, you can handle it. You're our guy. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, dude. I've been in real fights. Yeah. <laughs> this is not going to fucking bother me at all. So I went down there and they flew me to LA and I'm sitting there. So my first interview live was Noel from Oasis. But the first interview for the new music was this cat. And they sent me down to the studio. It's in Silver Lake in LA and I'm just in Hollywood and I'm waiting. And he walks in and he says, uh, I know why you're here. I said, good. And he said, how's it going to go? I said, that's really up to you, man. It's really up to you. And he said, it'll go well. And I said, okay. And I wasn't really warm. I'm a warm fella, yeah. but I'm not effusive. So I was like, all right, I've seen you mistreat this person. Come at me, bro. And he, and he made me wait 13 hours. He was a dick about it. And 13 hours. Yeah, cats used to do that, right? It's like they all think they're Vladimir Putin, right? They, they, you know, it's all about control for some of those guys. Not all of them, but some of them. So I just waited, and then I did the interview, and it went really well. Like, it went really well. And uh, that was the beginning of... So whenever there was a challenging, where things could go, go... Also, I was a lot older. Like, when I got hired at Much, I was 28 years old, 27, 28 years old. And it's really unfair to take a 20-year-old who was brand new in the business and put him up against a band that are world beaters. It's very challenging. And... Lots of bands were gracious about it, but a lot, it's not what they did. So they just needed a, oh, this is what they told me. This is their words. They just needed somebody who could go into those kind of battles and come out smiling. And that's me, right? So that, my career started that way, so I don't get nervous, right? So this person that you went and yeah. did the battle with, without having to battle, are you friends with them now? No, no. But, um... We had a lot of good interviews over the, our career. And then he really fucked us over huge, huge on Much Music. I haven't seen him since. Really? Yeah, but I don't have any problems with him. No. And if I saw him, I'd be... In fact, I, I kind of want to talk to him again because... I mean, people really hated him. He was really big, but people hated him. And I never hated him. I thought he was interesting. I thought he was a great songwriter, too. And... I think now is the, I, I want to sit across from again. There's only like four people in my entire career, only four in 25 years or 20 odd years of interviewing, that I look at them and I think, now oh, you're bad people. Like four, maybe five. And because most people aren't bad people. But there's four or five who I remember sitting across from going, if I never spend a second with you again, I'm all right. Um, one of them apparently is a born again Christian now. So I'd like that shot. That could be different. Yeah, let's talk again. <laughs> but again, I, 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 have, I don't hold any grudges because I don't really care. You know, it's like people are people. They're tired. They're exhausted. They go through bad things. People are in different stages of addiction. Who knows what their mental health reality is? Who knows what their blood chemistry is at that moment, right? Does people it, have bad days. Bad days. Yeah, but, but on your worst day, you have to treat people well. Yeah. You should still be able to. Give a smile. If you're having a shitty day, treat yourself badly. Don't treat others. You know, we, we, need, we need higher standards. <laughs> it's so true. Everything you, everything you say is just, I mean, you bring me back to my childhood. You bring me back to I'm why. I'm old. I'm not old, aren't I? <laughs> I'm sorry I'm swearing. So, do, every, do everybody swear on your shows all the time? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. yeah you're fine. <laughs> I don't mean that you're old. I just mean that I, I grew up with, with watching what you do. And when I was younger, same sort of thing. I'm going to be a singer. I'm going to be this. I'm going to do that. I can't do that. 
so which you have said isn't true um but then watching you and it's like that's that's it that's what i want to do it's and a great responsibility it's a great responsibility to be able to connect somebody to something that can impact their lives if you can connect them to a book if you can connect them to a story to a human to a song that makes somebody feel better tonight or challenges them to be better that is a mega responsibility and i'm glad you're doing it because we need it well i have to thank you cuz i'm sure you don't remember it but when i actually went to school for broadcasting i had sent you an email oh, did you yeah and I'm you really bad at emails. No, you replied right away. Oh, and oh, good, dude. I, I'm so I like I don't check my voicemail, my email. So there's a. I'm sorry. Okay, I did write you back. You did. What did I, I say? It was the greatest thing ever. It was just so encouraging. And it was. Yeah. Oh fuck. Okay. <laughs> I never. I'm sorry. Okay, good. No, I'm glad. Totally fine. And I was just like, this guy's for real. What, and this is back? why. Yeah. yeah. And this is why I want to do what I want to do. So thank you. Oh, hey. Well, I'm glad it went this way then, as opposed to the other way then. <laughs> Sorry I didn't write you back, which I have not written a lot of people back. Not out of malice. You just get busy and you're doing your thing, right? That's and the thing. You got it, yeah. Tons of people following you, you know? Well, I'm glad. Yeah. Well, I'm glad uh, that it worked out. Yeah, How was too. cool? Fantastic. Good. Yeah. Good. Good, good, good. <laughs> and it's gotten me to this point, which I can't, you're I can't a lot argue. Of people. You interview a lot of people. I've been very yeah. lucky. Very lucky. As you said, it's, it's a lot of lucky breaks. Keep fighting it, man. Keep fighting it. Do the, just remember what Bruce Coburn said, right? You just keep kicking at the darkness till it bleeds daylight. That is the key to being a responsible broadcaster. All the people that you've interviewed, all the movies that are coming out now, is there a certain role that you would want to see a certain person do? I, there's an actor called Olivia Coleman. She's in the show Broadchurch. There's an... Oh, it's amazing. And there's an actor called Amanda Abington who's in Sherlock. I want to see the two of them not remake The French Connection, but I want to see the two of them in something that felt like The French Connection. To me, those two actors, I think Amanda and Olivia are... There may be people as good as them, but I don't think there's anybody better than them. I really don't. And I would love to see them in a, a gritty film. There's a lot of decent gritty... Broadchurch is gritty, right? But you know that French Connection had that fucking gnarly, uncomfortable... Social, you know, it was a really pessimistic worldview, which I love in films. I, I, I don't want a positive worldview in films. I, I already have a positive worldview, right? I want, a, I want something almost nihilist. And I felt like that from the French Connection for me. And I think Olivia and Amanda would be unbelievable in that, in something like that. And you've had a different, a few different roles in movies, whether it's as yourself or, you know, being that bartender. Or uh, is there a role that is... Is there a role that if I think so, hey? Rude. <laughs> we even bought coffees. I know it's rude. <laughs> uh, is there a role that if somebody came to you and said, George, I want you to play this, that you would say yes to in a heartbeat? I want to be in the new TV series called The Mayans. Okay. There's a TV series. It's the spinoff of Sons of Anarchy. It's bike gangs. I think about motorcycles all the time. I think about motorcycles the way my mother thinks about Jesus. And she thinks about Jesus a lot. That's how I think about motorcycles. Um, I want to be in the Mayans. I, I love ho thrillers and horror films. But I really want to be in the Mayans. I look at that. I, watch Win I like Winona Earp. I want to be in Winona Earp. I want to be in... Um, I love Broadchurch so much. I, know that, I don't know what they're doing now. He's in Sherlock. Those kinds of shows. I want to be in those kinds of shows but so does everybody else who acts but I really want to be in the Mayans because first of all it's in a sunny climate so it's that and I love deserts so that washed out motorcycle nasty shit that's what I want to do cool. yeah. I hope it happens I don't know Kurt Sutter follows me on Twitter that excited me you know? you go. but that's about it
It's a door. That's right. That's just kick door. it open. That's right. <laughs> All right, they're kicking us out. Yeah. So we got to get to the socks okay. question. I know. I know. I, know. I need to know. Okay, I got this one here. Beautiful. Oh, I think I'm wearing matching ones today. Then let me those see. are like sock monkey socks. I guess they are, but they're blue. I like it. They're blue. Yeah. All right, that's one. I don't know what the other one is. Oh, it's a match. We got a match. Oh. The rare, rare time where we get a match. Your That's life insane. is going to flash before your eyes. No, this is just the Matrix, oh, bro. it's a happy mistake. The Matrix gave me a matching pair of socks today. That's it. That's cool. <laughs> I hope that I am the only person to ever ask you on a day that you're wearing matching socks. Yeah, I think you are. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Thank you so much, George. Right. I appreciate it so really much. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming down here. Oh, of course. All the way from your neighborhood, which is way the hell down All there. All the way. <laughs> you're fantastic. Cool. Is that right? Thank you yeah. so much. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You're awesome. Thank you.